Hey, my name is Jacob McPhail. I am a scientist at Stressmark Biosciences in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, um, and I'm excited to be here for the LabRoots Neuroscience 2022 presentation. I'm going to be talking about characterizing pathology-inducing protein aggregates as tools for, for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease models and drug discovery. And here on the cover page, I have a, a TEM image of some of our oligomers we've generated for alpha-synuclein, some pathology in primary neurons, our, our new AFM unit that allows us to characterize our fibrils in-house, and one of the cool experiments I'm going to talk about, which is the actual transmission of our preformed fibrils of alpha-synuclein. So, as I said, we're in Victoria, BC, Canada on the West Coast. We are a life science reagent company. We make antibodies, proteins, amino assays, and we have a particular focus on the pathological proteins involved in neurodegenerative diseases. Alzheimer's and Parkinson's diseases are the most common neurodegenerative disorders. And believe it or not, Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death in the US. And this is actually likely closer to third in those aged over 65. And despite this significant impact, no cures are known. So we do know that uh, both are characterized by the presence of plaques in the brain, and these consist of protein aggregates, which include the key proteins alpha-synuclein, amyloid beta, and tau. These three proteins share a common pathological mechanism where fairly flexible monomers in a, in a healthy cell form these uh, ligamer structures, and these eventually aggregate into fibrils, which are observable in these plaques. And our goal at, at Stressmark is to generate active pathology-inducing aggregates in vitro to aid disease model development and accelerate Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, drug discovery. Looking at alpha-synuclein, normally it regulates synaptic vesicle trafficking in neurons. The structure when it's membrane bound is, is believed to be alpha helical at the, the end terminus here and a flexible C terminal tail. And this is important because this serine 129, when it's phosphorylated uh, in Lewy bodies is actually a, a hallmark of Parkinson's disease. So in these Lewy body aggregates, there's a, there's a concentration of phosphorylated serine 129 alpha synuclein. In solution when it's not associated with any sort of membrane, alpha-synuclein adopts this low secondary structure, sort of unfolded structure. And um, through various mechanisms that have been studied, but nothing definitive as of yet, these alpha-synuclein monomers form oligomers and eventually aggregate into these, these larger, more insoluble fibrils. And in those insoluble fibrils, we get a concentration of phosphoserine-129. And this aggregation is, is um, identified in, in Parkinson's disease. So actual patients with the disease um, post-mortem are observed to have these, these aggregates in their brain. We have been able to generate several types of these alpha-synuclein. We call them preformed fibrils in vitro. And taking regular soluble monomeric alpha-synuclein expressed in E. coli. We're able to fibrilize that in the lab. And it's important to note that this, because we're using an E. coli source, doesn't have any phosphorylation. So E. coli doesn't have the, um, the mechanism to be able to phosphorylate proteins in their cells. So we know this stuff is, is non-phosphorylated at serine 129 coming out of our lab. Uh, we've been able to make these in uh, human, mouse, and, and rat alpha-synuclein variants so far. And looking at the actual fibril formation, so we use what's called uh, thioflavin T, so THT. This is a molecule that increases fluorescent emission at 482 nanometers um, upon binding to amyloid. So, so here, the, that rich beta sheet structure. And as fibrils are forming, those amyloids are, are forming and, and those more hydrophobic beta sheet structures are forming and we get an increase in, in fluorescence. Uh, and here we're actually able to show if we seed just soluble monomeric alpha-synuclein protein with fibril, we get a very robust uh, seeding ability. Uh, so we get more fibrils of those forming from those monomers by adding fibril. So we're actually initiating fibril formation with our 
call them seeds. And this actually induces that phosphoserine 129 Parkinson's related pathology in mouse brain. So here we have alpha nuclein preformed fibrils and just regular monomer as well. And you can see after an injection here on the top, monomer, we're not really getting a signal at either concentration. So this is a single unilateral injection into the dorsal striatum 30 days prior to immunohistochemistry. So we're looking for phosphoserine 129 presence with an antibody. We don't see a signal in the control down here in the, the inset in A uh, or in either of the monomer injections. But when we look at the preformed fibril injections, we do see that sort of darkened color, uh, especially in the, the higher concentration, it's, it's much more prominent, indicating that these preformed fibrils are initiating that Parkinson's-related phosphoserine 129 pathology, whereas the monomers are not. Again, these going in are not phosphorylated, so that's actually occurring in the brain after injection. Just taking a, a closer look and over time course here of, of the same experiment. So after injection into the um, intrastriatal region here, we have monomer over the course of 120 days, we're not seeing any pathology. Again, we're, we're using an antibody to look for phosphoserine 129 here. Preformed fibrils, pretty prominent increase up to 120 days. Even after 60 days, we're seeing that pathology there over time. Now looking at a region distal from the injection site. So is, is this actually transmitting through the brain? And we find that it does. So monomer, again, no increase in phosphoserine 129 pathology, but in the preformed fibrils after 60 days, 120 days, we see significant staining for phosphoserine 129, and this is in the parietal cortex, which is away from, distal from the injection site, indicating an actual spread. It's also important to look at dopamine-rich regions, as, as these dopaminergic neurons are, are critical in, in Parkinson's disease. And again, we see our preformed fibril injections distal from this region are showing, even after 30 days for the preformed fibrils, significant pathology of, of phosphoserine 129. And again, nothing with monomer. Actually looking at the dopamine levels, we do see a significant decrease in both dopamine, which is displayed here, uh, and dopamine metabolites, which data not shown here, but uh, monomer, no effect on the, the dopamine levels, but preformed fibrils, 30 days, 60 days, 120 days, we're, we're getting an, an increase in the loss of, of dopamine, uh, which is produced in the dopaminergic neuron. So critical and, and associated with, with Parkinson's disease. These preformed fibrils, also we've shown them to bind to rat hippocampal neurons. So here we have our preformed fibril, and we've conjugated it to this ADO647 dye so we can observe it in neuronal cultures. And in red, we're looking at MAP2 staining, so that's the pan-neuronal marker. And what you'll see here in the image are all of those little gray specks are actually our, our preformed fibrils. So we add them to the culture and then wash them. And this data was actually uh, provided by Dr. Rihanna Leek at Duquesne University. And what you'll see is, is there is a significant association of these preformed fibrils with these primary rat hippocampal neurons. So then the question is, are our preformed fibrils actually transmitted between neurons? And we designed this experiment where we took our preformed fibrils and labeled them with this BF555 fluorophore. And essentially, this is added to uh, eight-day differentiated GFP-expressing SHSY5Y, I'm just going to call them SHY5 cells, and um, these are washed away, and then these cells are trypsinized and transferred into a eight-day differentiated IPSC cell line. So we're adding these fluorescently labeled fibrils to one cell line, washing them away, trypsinizing them, and then adding them to a different cell line culture. And we're gonna look at the transmission of these fibrils into these, these different 
cell types. And that's what we see. So uh, here we're looking at the overall culture, and I'll, I'll break it into the, the different channels. But essentially, we're looking at DNA in blue, the shy 5 Y cells we're looking at in, in green here. And the fibrils are in red, and then tubulin, which is much more concentrated in the differentiated the neuronal differentiated iPSCs in purple. And what you'll see is the red is not just correlating to the regions of green where it was actually added to in the initial culture. We're actually seeing these fibrils have been transmitted into these uh, tubulin areas, which are representative of the iPSCs. So we're getting a transfer from the shy 5 y cells into the iPSCs, which is pretty cool. And looking at the different channels here, uh, it's very clear. On the right, we have tubulin, so that's representative of the iPSCs. Uh, fibrils, you'll see, correlate to regions that we're only seeing tubulin and not necessarily the chi 5 y GFP-expressing cells. So it's pretty strong evidence of, of transfer from those uh, initial cell line we added the fibrils to to the ones we've uh, transferred to. When thinking about all of these sort of pathological proteins, it's also important to look at the oligomer states, so the states that come before or, or are different from the, the fibrils and the preformed fibrils that we've generated. And we've been able to generate these kinetically stable alpha nuclein oligomers in vitro. And looking at the images here, we have a native gel showing a large size of the uh, kinetically stable oligomers. So they run right about at the separating stacking gel interface. And what's cool about these is after a freeze thaw in, in panel B here, or after an incubation for two weeks at 37 degrees Celsius, on SEC, we don't see a change in, in the size of the, of the oligomer. So it's not falling back into monomer. It's actually maintaining its, its structure. So here we have our trace for our oligomers, and there's always a small percentage of monomer around in these preparations. And after freeze thaws, it stays the same. And after 37 degree incubation, it stays the same. And on the right here is our, our TEM showing nice globular structure of these oligomers. And it's important to note that these are generated without any sort of inducer or inhibitor. There are some other ones we've been able to generate with dopamine and ECGC, which is a, a green tea molecule. And in terms of, of this, these, these are made on their own without any of these inducers. So trying to represent the most natural type of thing that we can. When we look at these oligomers versus fibrils, so not only do they look different under EM or, or AFM, but the actual secondary structure of these is, is different. So this is far UVCD, and essentially, based on the curve and the very negative signal here at 200 nanometers, our monomer is, is disordered. And when we look at our oligomer versus our fibril, what we'll see is our alpha helical content of these oligomers is much higher. And the beta sheet, sort of those more hydrophobic regions that bind THT when we're looking at it through a THT assay, those, those are higher in the fibrils. So there are distinct, even secondary structure differences in these. They're not necessarily just smaller pieces of, of the large fibrils. We're also able to generate that serine 129 pathology with these oligomers. So looking at here we have our, our control. We're looking at MAP2 staining, uh, and phosphoserine 129 is stained in green, and nuclei is, is stained in blue. And what you'll see here, and it's a little bit tough looking at this image, but you zoom in, you're able to see there's a, a yellow color which indicates overlap of this MAP2, so these dopaminergic neurons, and alpha nuclein serine 129 when it's treated with these oligomers. And we're able to quantify this over many different cultures and look at uh, toxicity, so the amount of neurons left, as well as pathology. And we find that these oligomers are toxic to primary rat dopaminergic neurons and also induce significant pathology. So looking at a couple of 
concentrations here in panel A, we see our monomer is not significantly toxic. So we're looking at the number of neurons remaining 11 days after addition of, of our alpha synuclein, either monomer or oligomer. And we see monomer doesn't have an effect, but at the higher concentration, we see a statistically significant effect of these kinetically stable oligomers uh, on the survival of these neurons. Panel B here, we're looking at the ratio of phosphoserine 129 relative to control. Again, we see monomer is not inducing any sort of phosphoserine 129 pathology, but at both concentrations tested, our oligomers are inducing significant phosphoserine 129 pathology. So at the highest concentration, we're getting both toxicity and pathology, and at our lower concentration, we're just getting sort of the start of pathology here. So that's it for alpha synuclein. I also want to talk about amyloid beta because we've been working on that quite a bit in the last few months to a year. Uh, and amyloid beta is also a key component of these neurodegenerative diseases. So it starts as amyloid beta precursor protein. It's an integral membrane protein concentrated in the synapses of neurons. Through this cascade and, and proteolysis, this is cleaved, resulting in this amyloid beta peptide. And this peptide ends up aggregating in, in Alzheimer's disease and forms the main component of amyloid plaques. And we've been able to generate, actually, um, both the oligomeric and the fibrillar form of this amyloid beta peptide. So we're starting with a synthetic peptide. So we're not coming from E. coli as we are from alpha synuclein. This is a synthetic peptide that uh, we generate these oligomers and fibrils from. And here's our, our TEM. So our monomer is, is fairly clean. Our oligomers are nice, round, globular oligomers. And these amyloid beta fibrils are much longer than the thinner and longer than the ones of alpha synuclein we've been able to generate. And here looking, so in-house, we've acquired the ability to do our own atomic force microscopy. And basically, this looks at a, a surface where you dry your protein on top of, and you scan it with a cantilever, and you're able to look at what the, the structure of that surface is. And we see here our monomer. We're not really seeing much. But like in the TEM, we're seeing these nice globular oligomers in our oligomeric preps and these nice long concentrated fibrils in our uh, fibrillar preps. They also have unique signals on a Western blot. So here we're using the 6010 antibody. And uh, this is able to identify basically all amyloid beta. It looks at the, the end terminus of it. So it's going to see any amyloid beta that's, that's in this Western blot. And for monomer, we see a nice 5 kilodalton protein. The peptide is, is 4.5 kilodaltons. In the oligomers, we see this, this signal of dimer trimer. It's a little faint in this image, around 15 kilodaltons, as well as sort of this smear between uh, 37 to 75 kilodaltons. And in fibrils with the 6010 antibody, we see a higher smear and, and this signal that's actually in the well of the SDS page gel. So a distinct Western atomic force microscopy signal, and the TEM as well, um, all lines up. And these are toxic. So we looked at uh, primary rat cortical neurons again. And here we're looking at the amyloid beta injury uh, after 14 days. And we're just quantifying the amount of neuron here. And our control, as well as our buffer, control. So the control is, is cells are just grown. The buffer control is uh, they're grown with the addition of the buffer that our oligomers or fibrils are in. And you'll see on the left there, the control is set at 100%. Our buffers on the right there in purple have no significant effect on the survival of these neurons. However, our oligomers and our fibrils in, in green and, and blue there show what looks like a dose-dependent toxicity effect. So increasing concentration from right to left here. So our, our lower concentrations are on the right and our highest concentration on the left. 
you see statistically significant uh, toxicity, which we're pretty excited about. Finally, we've also been working on tau. So tau normally in a cell it functions to stabilize microtubules. As it becomes phosphorylated, it falls off these microtubules. So again, tau is a pretty flexible protein. Uh, it'll bind to the negative charge of the microtubules. And when it's phosphorylated, it falls off. And through a process that's not fully understood yet, it also will form these oligomers and eventually these paired helical filaments and these neurofibrillar tangles, which are also present in Alzheimer's disease. And we've been able to generate from E. coli these tau fibrils as well, these preformed fibrils, from a variety of, of different lengths of tau and, and familial mutations. And typically, we need a heparin scaffold to be able to generate these fibrils. They don't readily form on their own. But we are also able to get pathology with the tau. So here we're looking at phosphoserine 202 and 205 on tau, as opposed to the Parkinson's phosphoserine 129 for alpha-synuclein. We're looking at tau. And after injections into the mouse hippocampus, we do, again, using um, IHC, we're using an antibody to stain this this phosphoserine 202, 205, we're able to see that uh, forms there. So in the inset, that's our negative control. There's no staining. But in, in all of these here, we're seeing significant staining of phosphoserine 202, 205. And again, coming from E. coli, we don't have any phosphorylation present on our tau. So it's actually inducing the, the pathology that would be present in Alzheimer's disease. Finally, uh, we have also generated these preformed fibrils using the baculovirus SF9 system. So this is a eukaryotic system that is able to phosphorylate. And coming out of this, we've actually identified up to 30 sites uh, by LCMS. And these fibrils will actually form on their own. So when this tau has been phosphorylated in the baculovirus SF9 system, we do see the ability for it to form fibrils on its own, and, and we're looking forward to seeing what pathology and, and toxicity we can observe with these new tau preformed fibrils. So that brings me to sort of the key conclusions and takeaways for this talk. And both our alpha nuclein and tau fibrils generated in vitro are able to seed additional fibrils and induce the hallmarks of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease pathology in both mice and uh, rat models. Our new alpha nuclein oligomers, which are also generated in vitro, are toxic to dopaminergic neurons and induce that phosphoserine 129 pathology as well. And our new amyloid beta uh, 1 to 42 oligomers and fibrils generated in vitro are toxic to rat cortical neurons. And moving forward, we want to look at the pathology associated with alpha synuclein or amyloid beta, sorry, oligomers and fibrils. As we just looked at toxicity, it would be interesting to look at uh, if that induces any effects in, in tau or alpha synuclein phosphorylation um, upon injection into mouse brain. We also are working on developing and characterizing tau oligomers. So those are really the uh, one remaining oligomer of these three target proteins we do not have, um, we haven't produced yet. And we're also interested in studying sort of the behavioral effects induced by our oligomers and preformed fibrils. So we have the pathology and, and the toxicity, but what overall effect do these potentially have on the organism's behavior as we're trying to um, build towards these Alzheimer's and Parkinson's models? So I wanted to thank um, everyone at the Stressmark team, in particular Ariel Laurer, the CEO, Kristen, and uh, Vicky. And any questions? I wish we had time for, for questions, but this is an online presentation. It's pre-recorded. So uh, I'm happy to take any uh, questions by, by email. And, and um, we're always looking for new people to um, partner with and work with. So uh, if you're looking for any Additional information on, on some of the constructs I've talked about today, just visit our website. Uh, and thank you very much for listening.